Oh, hey y'all. I am live. Um, it's my first live, so I'm gonna do for this global strike, um, this general, global general strike, we're gonna be doing a teach-in on Palestine with maps. Now, these are maps that the folks, um, the, the folks who invited me in Boyle Heights at Holland Beck Park, that homeschooling crew or unschooling crew printed out for me. And uh, I still have them. And I think that they're really helpful for when we want to talk about Palestine, but we don't have a PowerPoint or anything like that. And talking about Palestine with maps, I think is really effective. And that's something that, I mean, that's how I um, became initially really interested in what was happening. And so we're going to start with this map. This is a map of the world according to Europeans. Europeans in the in the medieval era understood that the world has three continents only, Asia, Europe, and Africa. Except like if you if you know your map, you know Europe is not a continent. It's Euro-Asia. It's not Europe, but Europe has created itself as as a, I'm just going to wave to everybody. Hey, everybody. Sorry, you're making me pause. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, so Europe created itself as a continent in uh, uh, the medieval period um, and separated itself from Asia and Africa with Jerusalem in the middle. See how there's Jerusalem in the middle? That's Palestine. And notice this part right here, this is the, the Red Sea. They actually co colored it red, uh, which is the, which is very biblical. So there's a, Europe is very connected, very much connected to Christianity. In particular though, Christendom, not, not just Christianity, but Christendom. Christendom is uh, a territorial control uh, and, and largely through empire. So Christianity, like all of our religions, all of our world has a, a tension between um, liberation, freedom and security, which can lead to a politics of fear for the security paradigm or politics of love or respect, as we say in our communities, uh, for the, more, the freedom paradigm as collective freedom. So Christianity was co-opted by empire under Constantine in the 300s um, before Common Era, BCE. And that co-optation of Christianity made it so that the empire got a lot of legitimacy about its existence by saying that it was the closest thing to God on earth. And so Christendom and empire, particularly the Roman Empire, always understood itself as as having a center of the world where Jerusalem is, where Palestine is. And it's a very apocalyptic uh, vision as well that they've carried about how the rapture will, will take place there, which has sadly been to the detriment of the peoples living there, Palestinians, because for a lot of more fundamentalist Christians, they believe that Jews need to be in Palestine to build the third temple so that the Messiah can come back, Jesus. And so that's Christian Zionism that is very, very worth looking more into because by far Christian Zionists outnumber Jewish Zionists. And it's a really, uh, it's a marriage made in hell. I mean, we might call it that Christian Zionism and Jewish Zionism in that Christian Zionists want Jews to create a state in Palestine, Israel, so that they can go there, build the third temple. And then when the end of the world, when the rapture comes, everybody's going to die in a fiery hell except for the Christians, which includes the Jews. And uh, they have, you know, this vision for Palestine as God-given. I know a lot of people in my life and maybe you know a lot of people in your life too, uh, who are maybe uh, evangelicals and call Jews the chosen people and have this prophecy that they're trying to follow, which is why they support Israel, because they want Jews to build the third temple. So 
This is really important to know about Palestine. It's very important to know about Jerusalem, how Jerusalem, for the European imagination, was the center of the world. And a lot of the time, for a lot of people, it still is. It's just that this kind of cartography doesn't really take place anymore. Um, even though it's a perfectly good map that shows the sacredness of a place, the center of the world, sacred geography. Um, and we know mostly just the, the contemporary map, the grid, um, the scientific map. But this map is really helpful because we see in the European imagination, the geographical imagination, the ways that Europeans understand Palestine. And of course, themselves, vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world, with you know splitting away from Asia and inventing its own continent, and then of course Africa, which Europe has always, uh, since its creation, almost has understood itself as uh, being in negative relation to uh, Africa. This, before we turn away from this map, I just want to uh, bask in its glory, too, because it's very beautiful. And it's one of those maps that has, you know, the, the mermen and the mermaids there and also the sea creatures. And so there's a sea creature there and there's a ship. And then there's one up at the top, just a tail. And what these, what these illustrations symbolize is um, feelings. Uh, feelings of, of what's exotic, for example, with the mermen and the mermaids over in the Indian Ocean. There was a lot of trade in the Indian Ocean, it was very active, and that was between Africa and Asia and not so much, you know, Western Europe, which, you know, had to eventually learn to travel under Africa in order to get there. But was really uh, understanding this place to be exotic. So you see, that's why you see the mermen and the, and the mermaids. And then down here, there's a beast near Africa. And also near this new land that they just learned about after, you know, shortly before this map was published. This map was published in 1581. And it says America. And so... What's important to know, too, is why we also don't see maps of the world like this anymore is because there's also this other huge continent, Abiyala, Turtle Island, called the Americas by the Europeans. And so maps changed. After, after they learned about us here, their maps changed. The, this is very medieval in its orientation. But just because maps don't look like this as much anymore doesn't mean that they that this sentiment is is not still alive and in fact there is a map of this replica made out of tiles in Jerusalem that Israelis Zionists actually have put up right near the old city and I'd walk by it all the time when I would go to my Arabic class and I remembered it so this is a 1581 medieval map and now a more contemporary map of Jerusalem looks like this now, this is a state of Palestine, proposed state of Palestine. And if you look at Jerusalem, it doesn't look so sacred. There is uh, Jerusalem and East Jerusalem. And East Jerusalem has a font size that's slightly bigger than Jerusalem and slightly bigger than Amman, Jordan's capital, and slightly bigger than Tel Aviv. Israel's capital. East Jerusalem is actually like the real Jerusalem. It's the, it's the OG Jerusalem. But what happened was that the Israelis created another Jerusalem uh, shortly after taking the land and in their terror, genocidal terror and ethnic cleansing in 48, next to the old city of Jerusalem, which they did not take until 1967. Before 1967, Israel created a expanded Jerusalem and uh, now calls it Jerusalem and the old city East Jerusalem. Well, Palestinians, when they go into the negotiations, when they have gone into the negotiations with Israelis and, and um, the United States to create a two-state solution, which this is a proposed map of a two-state solution with the West Bank and Gaza being the state of Palestine, which never ever happened. There is no state of Palestine. It's really important to know. This is a proposed map. 
uh, the idea was that East Jerusalem would be the capital of Palestine, but Israel refuses, refuses to cede an, even an inch. It has occupied so much of the West Bank since taking it over in 1967. Here's the Gaza Strip, and I want to take this opportunity to, to point out that the people of the Gaza Strip, the Palestinians there, largely refugees, come from these areas in the white that are now the territory of the state of Israel, and they're walking distance, and they fled there during the war that created Israel in 1948. They fled to the Gaza District, the area, to, for safety, but have been penned in ever since because Israel will not let them go back home, and that's been for 75 years. So this is not really a map that can tell us how important Jerusalem is. Like that previous map, like this one, that puts Jerusalem in the center of the world. This one is just, it's just a place just like any other place, or maybe a little bit more important because it's the capital, but just like any other capital. And so what these maps do, because they're so hegemonic, not in an in, 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 in and of themselves, but because they're the only dominant map that people use, that, that we're forced to use now, it makes it seem as if Palestinians can just get whatever land traded for Jerusalem, as if this territory is equal in, to this territory, it doesn't make any sense. So that's why it's important for us to not get our information just from one source, because if you were to get it from just a map like this, without knowing anything about Jerusalem, uh, without having heard anything about it or knowing anyone and how they talk about Jerusalem, any Muslim, Christian, or Jew, because Jerusalem is important to all three Abrahamic faiths. If you didn't know about that history, you would think that the Palestinians were just being unreasonable by not accepting a state without Jerusalem as their capital. But the more you learn, the more you realize that it's actually not this simple. Then you learn a lot more. And then you realize actually it is that simple. It's, it's not this simple, but it's as simple as people just taking over your land and wanting you dead. So that's what's happening in Israel-Palestine, sadly, is that the state of Israel was created from the very, very beginning with the idea of depopulating, exterminating, moving, however they want to call it, just disappearing, even unaliving if necessary, and it has been necessary. All of the people who live in this land, in these borders, cut in 1923 by the British and the French and the other European powers. The state of Israel from the very beginning has needed to exterminate Palestinians. That's, been, that's why we say this has been going on. That's why Palestinians have been telling us it's been going on not just since October 7th, since for, for at least 75 years, 100 if we're talking about these borders and a little bit longer than that if we're talking about other colonial schemes like the Balfour Declaration that promised this land to the Zionist movement, that the British imperial powers who had colonized Palestine promised the Zionist movement in Europe for, that they would have. Next map. <clears throat> so when I talk about Palestine, the history of Palestine, most of the time the story begins in the 19th century. Either from when the moment that the Zionist movement began in the late 1800s, late 19th century, or in the early 19th century, where when Napoleon came to Palestine and Egypt and tried to conquer that you know, those territories, mostly to cut the canal with the Suez Canal, which was not there, but it, uh, the idea was to cut the canal so that he could take India, have a short trip to India and take that away from take that colony away from the British. So either way, the historiography, how, how, how history is written about Palestine, usually begins in the 19th century, whether it's the earlier part of the 19th century with Napoleon and his canal scheme, which by the way, he was a Zionist too, and he had the idea of bringing European Jews to the land to allow Europeans to have control of the land. But I start a lot earlier, and the reason why I start a lot earlier than that, and I don't want to do it because, um, you know, to say, oh, this has been going on for thousands of years, there's no solution, which is not true. 
uh, I mean, humanity's beefs have been going on for a lot since ever, ever since we've been around. But Palestine has been colonized only very recently in the history of colonialism. And it is because it is a colonial project that they're fighting. We need to understand what that project is before it even comes to us. And it came to us in 1521 and to the Taino people in 1492, but it had come previously to other people living in Europe. In Europe before it came to us, this, this colonial project, this project to impose one way on everybody, uh, one faith, one religion, one language, one way of being mostly is what it is, and not respect other worlds. That was happening internally to Europe before it happened to the rest of us. So I start in 1492, and I don't start in October 12th. On October 12, 1492, I start on January 2nd, 1492. And that is the day that the final ethnic cleansing of the Iberian Peninsula, uh, uh, that the, of the Muslims happened. January 2nd, 1492 was when Granada surrendered to the Catholic monarchs. Granada was Muslim. It was part of what folks call the Moors, rule in the Iberian Peninsula for centuries, since the 8th century. And this, this, the Catholic monarchs call it a Reconquista, and what they mean by that is that they've understood that land to, be, to have been there since before Islam, and so then they want to make it uh, Christian Catholic again. What happened in January 2nd, 1492, is that when the last Muslim stronghold surrendered, we saw the beginning of the creation, the birth of modern Europe. And a lot of scholars talk about it like that. They either talk about 1492 as being the birth of modern Europe or 1453, a few decades before that. What happened in 1453 was that the Roman Empire finished falling. It was done in 1453. Its last stronghold was in the east in Constantinople city of Constantine, who co-opted Christianity. And it was taken by the Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire, a Muslim empire. And so there was a lot of fear from Europeans that from the East, this huge wave of Islam was threatening. You know, they were, they were getting close to Venice. And over in the West, where the Iberian Peninsula is, on the western, westernmost tip of Eurasia, of Europe, quote unquote, that, you know, they were, they were cleansing that part of Islam. So they understood that as a huge success, January 2nd, 1492, just being done with Islam in the Iberian Peninsula. And so that was a momentous affair. Columbus was there. He was in Granada on January 2nd, 1492, waiting for Granada to fall. And the reason for that was because he was trying to get Queen Isabella, who was the one whose forces were fighting the Muslims. It's a holy war. It is, it's not talked about, like, about it like that, but it's the holy war that Isabella and Ferdinand were on then and on October 12th because what Columbus and Isabella discussed is let's get Jerusalem next. You could understand why they would want Jerusalem next, right? The medieval imagination, the geographic imagination of Europe puts Jerusalem at the center of the world. And in fact, there's a book called Columbus and Jerusalem. Silvio Winter, the great writer, is someone who um, pointed me to that, not personally, but through her writing. She writes about 1492 a lot, and I'm very inspired by her work. And she points out in her writings, and that was the first time I learned that Columbus was apocalyptic. He had he was very pious, like Isabella, and was also on a holy war with her. And in his diaries, he put in there that the reason for his voyage west was to take Jerusalem next, since they couldn't go east because it was hostile forces, even though Jerusalem's east. They knew that the globe was round, 
And so he wanted to go west to then connect with the other empires in the east to battle the Ottomans or, and the Mamluks actually at the time who had uh, Palestine, but to battle the Muslims. And that was his scheme. And then of course he ran into us and them running into us and all of the death and destruction that they have wrought since then has made Europe very powerful and very rich, very strong militarily. Um, and so in 1494, actually in 1493, uh, right away after it was, it was learned that there was these new territories, the, um, well, not yet necessarily, but that there were territories over in the West. Portugal wanted it. The, the, the Catholic monarchs in, monarch in Portugal wanted that. And so the Portuguese and Isabel and Ferdinand start to fight. But they're all Catholic monarchs, and so the Pope steps in and doesn't want them to fight. He doesn't want them to fight. And so he says, let's, let's invade these new territories. Let's invade the world peacefully with a contract of a line, a border. And the, the Pope draws a line, this green line right here. This is the map, draws this line. There's a dotted one first. That was 1453. And then it got uh, revised to the darker green one in, in 14, I'm sorry, 1493 and 1494. And that gave permission, said the Pope, for Spain to invade everything west and Portugal to invade everything east. And then eventually they had to draw this other line uh, after they went around the globe to see where they should stop, where each one should stop. And that's the Treaty of Zaragoza. This is the birth of, of global linear thinking, of borders, of world borders. The, the borders that we know of today, this is the moment of their birth. It's from October 12, 1492. So we have two major events in 1492, and one of them with the fall of Granada. It is an ethnic cleansing of the Iberian Peninsula of not only Muslims. Almost right away, the Spanish monarchs, the Catholic monarchs, heighten their inquisition, heighten their um, persecution of Jews. They, they tell them, you have to convert. You can't be Jewish anymore. You have to convert or you have to leave. And so the ones who converted, a lot of the time, they were, people would be really suspicious about them. Uh, were, they, were they really faking it at home? I mean, were they faking it in public and, and were still Jewish at home? And so they had an inquisition where they would torture people to confess. And I mean, they had... They have these torture methods that they have, they have an exhibit. I don't know if they still have it, but I, I was able to go to Granada in um, 2021 when the Zapatistas were traveling Europe and I followed them and I went to Granada for a week uh, because I was studying this portion of this book that I'm writing. And I saw that they have, that's when I learned that Columbus was there. They have a statue of Columbus with Isabella and um, with both dates, January 2nd and October 12th. And across the street from the really beautiful red castle that all of the tourists go to see, the Alhambra, there's an old city. And I was in the old city and a sandwich board sign welcomed me to visit the, um, an exhibition of the Inquisition's torture methods. And so I went and I learned that a lot of the things, a lot of the atrocities that the Europeans inflicted on us, they had inflicted on each other and still are inflicting on each other. That was, that was a lesson, a great lesson that I got from the Zapatista trip in Europe, just in general, that there's a Europe from above and a Europe from below. And the below has been resisting for a really long time. There's still indigenous people who understand themselves to be indigenous in Europe uh, and are trying to be different and don't want to be European, quote unquote, in that homogenous white way that understands themselves as the boss of the world, as the owner of the world. So there's a Europe from above and a Europe from below. And there's always been a Europe from above and a Europe from below. 
And so the burning of books also, they burned the Muslims' books, the Europeans, the Spanish did, and they also burned the Maya books, our books. We have only four left in existence that are known. And so what we get with January 2nd, 1492, is an ethnic cleansing of anybody who is not the same as who the Catholic monarchs want them to be, Catholic. So ethnic cleansing of Muslims, ethnic cleansing of Jews. That happens, uh, that, that's the inauguration and the possibility in, uh, January, on January 2nd, 1492, uh, be, precisely because, and it could because when they were, the Iberian Peninsula was under Muslim rule, there was convivencia, convivencia. there was people who, there was coexistence. There is, you could be Muslim, you could be Christian, you could be Jewish. You didn't have to be just one way. Well, you didn't have to be just one religion. You could be one of those three. Um, but when Isabella comes in and her forces, they, they ethnically cleanse the entire Iberian Peninsula, forcing Jews to flee, to leave, if they don't convert. And sadly, a lot of them... Uh, come to these lands. People who are being oppressed come to these lands and become colonizers, are colonizers here. And so we see this as a theme that happens a lot, is that there is um, a system of above and below that the oppressed, the one option that they have to survive is to either flee, and now today where do we flee to, right? That's a really important question, maroonage, that the black radical tradition teaches us a lot about. You either flee, and if you don't flee, then you need to assimilate into the above. You need to become above. And so you need to shift context somehow, where now you're no longer below and you're above. And that's what happened with a lot of people who have been oppressed in Europe, whether it's Jews, whether it's Muslims, whether it's peasants who were forced off of their lands as capitalism was growing and privatizing land. Land that had not been private before became privatized. And people who had worked the land before, peasants, were forced to become factory workers, were forced to become workers, waged workers, proletari the proletariat. And so what Europe did and has done and continues to do is export its contradictions out. It has a lot of contradictions internally, Europe does, and it likes to export them out. And one of them is violence. So people who were resisting being dispossessed of the land, well, why don't you go find some land in those colonies over there, right? Is what the imperial powers would tell them or what their own powers would tell them. And they would, and they would find their freedom by subjugating others, by stealing from others, by destroying others, by enslaving others. We get both genocide and enslavement. You get both erasure, genocide, and dehumanization, enslavement. We get that, we see that in 1492, erasure and dehumanization of Muslims and Jews that now we don't hardly even know this history, that there was Muslims in Spain, that there was Jews in Spain, we hardly know. In school, we hardly get taught this. And then of course the erasure and dehumanization of the native indigenous peoples on Avia Yala on these lands and our African relatives who were kidnapped and forced to be enslaved. 1492 leads to this. This is a peaceful agreement between Europeans. It's so that the Europeans do not fight. This is a border, not for the people or communities on the ground. It's for those who are going to rule from above as if they're God and they can cut up the world and give it out as a piece of property, as an object. So. This is where I, I, I like to start the story of the borders of Palestine here. The borders of, of, of any geography that we live in starts here and with January 2nd, 1492, because it's not just borders, it's borders. 
the borders exist for the above. There are agreements for the above. This was an agreement for the Catholic monarchs with the Pope for the above so that the above doesn't fight. But they build their world, this world of 1492, they build it off the backs of the below. They build it by crushing the below. Their foundation is the below. Europe, non-Europe. In order for Europe to create itself, it had to, because this is it, the cosmovision that it, it follows, it had to dehumanize others. It had to re understand itself as the positive to the negative of others. So everyone is negated. And so, so for example, white is made superior, black is made inferior, Europe is made superior, non-Europe inferior. So it's above and below, superior, inferior. And the above makes their lives at the expense of the below. So these borders, these borders exist for the above. International law exists for the above. It does not exist for Palestinians. It does not exist for us. It exists for agreements for the above and those who the above allows in or those who allow themselves in with nuclear weapons. This is why a lot of states want to have nuclear weapons so that another nuclear power doesn't attack them. It's a deterrence device. See how messed up this all is? You see what world we're living in? This is where we're at 500 years later. Immediately we start getting then the cutting up of Abiyayala into vice royalties. The vice royalty of New Spain becomes Mexico. We have the vice royalty of Peru. Notice Brazil here. Brazil speaks Portuguese because this part was to the east of the Treaty of Tordesillas line. And then the rest speak Spanish. And then here, British. Uh, the British took it. So folks speak English. We speak English. And notice that with the ways that we speak, the languages that we have, we can tell how much has been destroyed and lost if we understand the history of these lands and how diverse the peoples here have, have been for millennia and how many different languages exist. Still exist, but have, many have been exterminated so that, you know, so that we all speak just one language. So like, again, a logic of imposing one way on everybody, everybody having to be the same. This is, what, this is the logic of empire. It's the logic and the practice is that there's an above and a below. And in order to survive, if you're in the below and being crushed, you gotta become acceptable to the above. And that's assimilation. So we start getting these, the cutting up of the vice royalties. And again, these are just contracts between colonizers over who's gonna control what. The indigenous populations, indigenous communities were not consulted. This is not for, this is not for anyone below. This is just for the above. Very painfully, sadly, in the late 19th century, this happens to Africa. Now this happens to Africa in Europe with a map of, of Africa on the wall and the European powers in Berlin, in Germany, are trying to decide who's gonna take what. This is the 1880s. It lasts for a few decades, for a couple of decades. And you see here, it's hosted in Germany Germany has just become a nation state. Nation states are brand new. Germany had just become a nation state in 1870, and so had Italy. That's what they call it by unifying, which means that they had to destroy every, everyone else's languages and ways of being, and everybody had to homogenize into one. That's the nation part. The state, the state is the government, the instrument of force, the monopoly of violence, whatever. It used to be controlled by the monarchs back in the day, but ever since people started having revolutions and overthrowing the monarchs, then there became, there, they had this question that they had to confront about how do we make decisions? And so this idea of the nation, the people are gonna make the decisions. Well, who are the people? Well, they should have something in common, a common history, a common language, a common something. And so then they create the nation. And that's when we get this push to assimilate everyone into this idea of what the nation is. It happens a lot in schools. Schools are a huge instrument for that. And of course, also in media and other aspects of culture. So Europe, uh, Europe after cutting uh, us up over here into these vice royalties, 
starts to cut, eventually starts to cut itself up into nation states. Uh, and Germany was a brand new one and decided it wanted to get into the game of empire too, along with the British and the French and everybody else who was in it in Europe. And so they hosted, Germany hosted the Berlin Conference, also called the Congo Conference, to cut up Africa. And they cut up Africa in this way, again, without consulting, without caring about the communities that live on the ground. This didn't happen on the ground. This happened on a wall map. And then in the middle, you see the Congo. The Congo was gifted by Europeans to a single European named King Leopold II, who treated the Congo as his personal rubber plantation and enslaved people there, communities there, and killed them if they refused to work or if they just didn't work well enough for him. And so what we see, that's really the logic. That really is the logic of this, this cutting up of the world from here, from Africa, right? We also then get it happening in the Eastern Mediterranean all the way to the Gulf. This is the territory that the Ottoman Empire held, but fell, the Ottoman Empire fell in, during the First World War in the early 1900s. And the Europeans were salivating over those territories for a really long time because everyone knew that Ottoman Empire was going to fall for like over 100 years, they knew. And so the Europeans were like, oh shit, what happens after the empire, Ottoman Empire falls, who's going to take all those territories, and especially who's going to take the Holy Land? That's Jerusalem. Remember what Palestine means to the medieval European imagination. Jerusalem, this is a world map. Jerusalem is in the center. Okay, So the Ottoman Empire held on to Jerusalem and Palestine for a really long time, allowed Jews to be Jews, allowed Christians to be Christians. It's very uh, largely Muslim, and so there were, they were, there have been Jews living in Palestine for a long time. A lot of the Jews that got kicked out of Spain went to Palestine, and and were living there for a really long time until then Israel was created, and it really messed up a lot of things, which we'll continue talking about. But see this logic of the Europeans cutting up the world that had already happened in Africa. in uh, just decades before and had happened in the americas a century before and had all started by this line the treaty of tordesillas that cut up the globe the pope cuts up the globe and tells spain you can invade this part and portugal you can invade that part so borders right so we're getting now to the shape of Palestine, that iconic shape of Palestine that we know, that one was actually created by evangelicals that went to Palestine after Napoleon's trip. And there's a lot more to talk about that. I'll do I can do another live if folks want. It's fascinating stuff. Um, but this was during the fall of the Ottoman Empire. The Europeans were secretly talking about how they were going to carve up the lands. And these nation states that we know of today, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, none of that existed before as nation states. Of course, there are people there since forever, just like us. But just because people don't have a nation state doesn't mean that, the, that they didn't exist before, which is sadly a line that Zionists throw at the Palestinians. That doesn't make any sense. But for some reason, they believe it. it probably has to do with the terrible education in this country, because it's really hard to have a real debate, a real conversation about Palestine and Zionism. So what we see here is in 1916, the Sykes-Picot Agreement, where the British and the French are cutting up the area of the Levant to the Gulf, so the Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean to the Gulf. Eventually, we get the creation of Iraq and Kuwait with Britain controlling that in the pink. And then Lebanon is created eventually in Syria with France uh, in the purple. And so like in Lebanon today and Syria, people speak French. And then Armenia for the Russians. And so we also get here um, a little port in Palestine, Palestine was supposed to be just uh, for international 
dominion under British, French, and Russian protection, quote unquote, really colonization. And notice that in the port on the north of Palestine, that's Akka, the British made that British rule. And that was specifically for a pipeline to be constructed from the Persian Gulf over to the Mediterranean Sea, which hasn't happened yet, but they're still talking about. Uh, it hasn't happened because the Palestinian resistance has, has gotten in the way. Okay, so going back to the Ottoman Empire, which we're all, everyone geeks out on after you learn about Palestine long enough, and I became one of those people. The Ottoman Empire's extent, see that it didn't have any borders? This was its extent, and even that, the, the limits of the yellow and the green should be blurred because there weren't borders before. There were front, their frontiers, and their frontiers of the Ottoman Empire, they merged and, and kind of overlapped with other empires. So this was the extent, and this is where we're looking at. This is Palestine. This is the Mediterranean right here. There's the Italy boot, and then this is the um, Red Sea and the Persian Gulf. Okay, so this is Ottoman Empire circa 1800s. Notice this. This is a historical accident. We know of that iconic shape of Palestine because of all the beautiful artwork that Palestinians have done with that. And Palestinians and so many who love the Palestinian resistance have done with this iconic map. These borders are new. Again, they were cut by the British and the French in 1923, they're new. The people, every single person, every family, every community who lived there, who was not Jewish, which was the majority, has been marked for extermination to create the state of Israel. And those are who we're talking about when we mean Palestinians, the people who have such long, beautiful history with this land that's been called a bunch of names for, as, for, for, for millennia, and Palestine a long time ago. These are who we're talking about. These are the people in resistance who, who this territory, Palestine, has been stolen. And it gets its shape earlier in the 19th century, in decades before. This is a map of, see how it says Western Palestine? And see how like it's getting that iconic shape? This is what influenced the previous map here of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, see that? that? That that shape of red Palestine is similar to this map of Western Palestine. This map of Western Palestine was the first map I could find uh, where Palestine gets that iconic shape in its modern borders. And it was created by evangelicals, by Christians. It was not created by Jews. It was created by Christians from Britain and the United States, mostly from Britain. There was evangelicals from the United States and from London who really believe that Palestine is theirs, that God gave them Palestine, like how they believe with manifest destiny that God gave them all of these lands. They believe that same thing. And so they're mapping Palestine as their own. They couldn't map it though. They're, you know, scholars that know ancient Hebrew and could understand the Arabic a little. They could hear echoes in the contemporary Arabic. There were echoes of Hebrew in it. And so they would create these place names like, you know, holy land place names. And the, the, the scholars called upon the help to map of the empire of the British cartographers, of the engineers, because they couldn't do it themselves. And so while the Ottoman Empire still held on to these territories, the British engineers, the military, together with the religious scholars, would map Palestine. And that happened in the second half of the 19th century. So like 1860s, 70s, and 80s. By the 80s, we have this. And this map has roads, it's got wells, water sources, and it, and it became a very important military map for the British when they were fighting the Ottomans a few decades later. And so this map is called Western Palestine because for them, for Zionists, they understand that the Holy Land is, goes far 
uh, um, it goes farther out to the, the, the Tigris and the Euphrates rivers in Iraq, present day Iraq. So Western Palestine, Eastern Palestine, this is the river. This is the river Jordan. And here's the sea. So from the river to the sea. Shout out to 805. Shout out to everyone who's, who's watching. Uh, we'll record this as well and put it up on our, our whatever, <laughs> on our IG. But notice that this is Western Palestine. The British did Western Palestine. And the U.S. Americans wanted to do the other part of Palestine. Um, or they wanted to also map. So, but the British are like, you know, y'all aren't really good map mappers. You, you can't really do that good of a job. So why don't we give you the part that's least important? And that's the eastern part. And we'll take the part that has the holy sites and everything. And that's actually what happened. The U.S. Americans messed up. They did not map the eastern part of Palestine. And because of that mess up, this is the only part of Palestine that was created when it was mapped. In a few decades later in 1923. And so this iconic shape of Palestine is what we know now, right? And now it begins with this panel right here of the of when um, of the eve of the creation of the state of Israel. There's white and there's green, and the white is Jewish settlements and the green is Palestinian settlements. Now those Jewish settlements, a large majority of them came from Europe. Actually, most of them came from Europe. I mean, there was Jews in Palestine since forever, but not as settlers in that way, where they were exclusively living and trying to create a nation state, an instrument of force. But they were purchasing the land there. And that was made possible from the British. Once, when the British had colonized Palestine, immediately they started to map Palestine in private property lots and individual lots in order to be able to implement capitalism more easily and sell land like it's an object, as a commodity. And so they started to do that. And it allowed a lot of European Zionists to to dispossess, to buy up this land and then kick out the native population there. And as the native people started to see this, they started to realize that every time someone comes and maps the land, like we eventually get displaced. So in 1936 to 39, they held down a three year uprising, the Arab revolt. And in the, in the reports of the British, you see them talking about the peasants and how they were breaking the cartographer's instruments that wouldn't let people map. And a lot of that actually happened over here in, the, in what becomes later the Northern West Bank. There was a lot of resistance there, which is why this part did not get, it's still Palestine, um, did not get, well, all of it is Palestine, of course, but this is not part of what is called so-called Israel proper and was certainly not the part that the United Nations would eventually, following this outline of the of Jewish settlements, the United Nations would create this map, this really strange map of two states, one of Israel and one of the native peoples. And in the middle is Jerusalem and Bethlehem, which is supposed to be international. Uh, and so because... The Palestinians did not accept this. It would mean that they would have to leave their lands and be transferred over to the green part. Everyone who lived in the white part would have to be transferred over to the green. It doesn't make any sense, but for some reason it made sense. And it still makes sense in a lot of European minds. At the same time, we were also seeing this, this population transfer between India and Pakistan and also a border cut between India and Pakistan where we had Muslims uh, from India, from what's called India now, be transferred over to Pakistan and Hindus in Pakistan transferred over to India. And that has worked out well, doesn't it? Hasn't it? It has worked out so well that there are nuclear tensions now between India and Pakistan. Then it's, it, it wasn't a weird thing for, for, for the colonizers. Like, and it's still not weird to them, even today, like they were talking about that with Iraq, you know, how to like split the country up in three and, and, and shift Sunni and Shia and everything and everybody, Kurds. And so what we see here is the native population refusing their own annihilation, their own expulsion. And 
Israel has to go to war in order to be created. And it is, it is supported by the European powers. It gets its weapons. I mean, it, it's, based, it's a European project. Israel is a European project. It's always been a project for European Jews. European Jews. There's been Jews all over the world. The, Israel is a, is a product project for European Jews because they're very close in the cosmovision of the empires. And so they were able to speak to that cosmovision. Hey, I, we know that you're oppressing us. He didn't even say it like that. Theodore Herschel, the founder of Zionism, didn't even say it like that. He understood that the problem of anti-Semitism was the fault of Jews. Outrageous, outrageous. Like, that's like saying that anti-blackness is the fault of black people. It's the fault of white people. <laughs> like, anti-Semitism is not the fault of Jews. It's the fault of Europeans who created that construction, that hatred of Jews, and called it anti-Semitism, or called, it, called them Semites because they were from the land of, quote-unquote, Shem. According to the Bible, there were th there are th the three continents here. There is a biblical story that a lot of them follow that talks about after the flood, Noah who built the ark, was drunk and had three, three sons, and one of his sons was laughing at him or something, and there's a curse on that son, and that son is called Ham. And there's another son called Shem and another son called Japheth. So Ham, Shem, uh, Shem and Japheth have been assigned by the European tradition to these three continents where the cursed son of Ham is Africa. And where Europe is Japheth, and where Asia is Shem. That's where Semitic comes from. And so Europeans would understand Jews as not belonging in Europe because they belonged in this area, in, in, Asia, in, in the Semitic area. So they started, you know, calling them Semites. Palestinians are Semites. This is why it's so maddening to even hear this term, anti-Semitic, because because who they mean are everyone in Palestine is a Semite. And that was a construction of the European power. So what we get with the state of Israel, what we get with Zionism, is the oppressed asking the oppressor for a place in the world. And not just a place in the world, a seat at the table. You know, there's in Washington, there's this huge saying. That people say it without even wondering how horrible it is. You're either at the table or you're on the menu. That goes around in DC circles and political circles, not just DC, I imagine maybe local circles. You're either at the table or you're on the menu. So you're either at the table of empire or you're gonna be crushed by empire. Those are the two options, the only options empire gives. You're either above or you're below. Which one are you gonna be? And that's sadly, what the Zionist movement adopted, that cosmovision of you're either above or you're below. There's lots of other cosmovisions. There's cosmovisions where we can live side by side, where we can respect each other's differences, where we don't have to assimilate, where we don't have to crush anybody. But no, that is the spirituality, I call it, of empire, is that some are superior and some are inferior. God loves, God loves some more than others. And that gives them permission then to do every atrocity to other people who they consider below and they've con and Europeans have considered Jews to be below for a very long time. And so what the Zionist movement did was appeal to the above, to their own oppressors, can we have a place in the world? And again, not just a place in the world, a seat at the table. And eventually it became Palestine where the Zionist movement would create its nation state. But it could have been anywhere as far as Theodore Herschel was concerned. He was the father of Zionism. And actually, as all of this cutting up of Africa was taking place, that's when the Uganda scheme of the Zionist movement came out. Hey, we can have a place in, in, in what's you know, today called Uganda, in Uganda uh, for this state. It was during the scramble of Africa. This is, this is with a, this is very much a, uh, colonial project, there is no, if you know the history, there is zero doubt Israel is a colonial project and it's really sad because it tricks a lot of people 
into believing in, in it. Someone saying, yeah, Samina, shout out, Bush, you are either with us or with the terrorists. That's exactly, then. and yes, the legacy of colonial binary thinking, that's exactly right. Like, you're, it's either this or that, and there's no other possible way, and so then we get stuck, right? And so we need to understand the Zionist movement like that. It's in a framework of empire. It's not a liberation movement for Jews at all. No liberation movement assimilates to become the oppressor of anybody else. That's not how we understand liberation at all. And again, this is a tension, and it's existed in Christianity, and it existed in Judaism, and it exists in Islam, and it exists in all of our worlds, whether we call them faith communities or secular movement, revolution. These tensions of how power is going to circulate, is it going to circulate from above to below and then extract again, back up to the above, so circulate in that hierarchical, uh, vertical way? Or is it going to circulate more horizontally where all of us are different and we're respected for all of our differences, right? That's the liberation movement. To be with empire is to be captive into either the above, below, the master slave, master slave, and the whole thing is about uh, you're oppressing me, so I'm going to fight you so that I can oppress you, right? And that's what a lot of Zionists believe about Palestinians and about us too. A lot of white folks call a uh, uh, white supremacist folks, they believe that if we were to get our freedom, that we would do to them what they did to us as if we're just out for revenge. Like, if we were out to do what has been done to us, we would become the monsters that we fight. We wouldn't be uh, in a part of a liberation project anymore. So Zionism is not part of a liberation project. That is still a question for our Jewish relatives, and they've been having it forever. And they're growing in strength, that position, thank goodness, because Zionism has really hijacked a lot of what we understand to be Jewish. And it makes it so that, as we're seeing now, even through law, making it so that any criticism of Israel is understood anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish. So it's trying, Zionism has been trying to define itself as Judaism, Judaism as Zionism. And there have been Jewish folks who've been resisting that forever and hopefully that resistance can grow and we can contribute to it and be a part of it with all of our worlds too it's not just this tension that's happening within judaism it's a tension again as i mentioned with christianity this has happened before um even zionism the co-optation of christianity by constantine by the roman empire and having then a christianity a religion of empire rather than a religion of creation, of nature, of Mother Earth, of respect, and about love. So Zionism was very much in the cutting up of Africa and wanting Uganda as a homeland for Jews. And eventually it ended up being Palestine because it couldn't really, that movement couldn't really get a lot of support. It couldn't even get that much support even though it was in Palestine um, because a lot of Jews were urban and Israel was expecting folks to learn to work the land, creating this idea. I mean, Israel is a really anti-Jew, anti-Semitic project in that its founders have created it so that Jews could assimilate into Europeans. Uh, there is a very sad saying in Israel among Israelis that Jews had to leave Europe in order to become European. And that's what this, the project of the state of Israel is. It, it understood Jews as weak because they didn't work their bodies, because they were nerdy, because they liked to read, because they're into books. And the, so what the state of Israel was for, like if you see recruitment posters for it, it showed like really buff people, including the women, like working the land. So there wasn't really a lot of attraction originally for the state of Israel among Jews for this new project. It wasn't really until after 1967 when Israel got more territory that it took from Palestine, all of Palestine, and uh, did it very quickly in, in six days. They call it the six-day war to kind of like show that it's biblical. Um, and on the seventh day, you know, God rested. Someone is asking, shout out, William. Someone's asking, do you think Europeans supported the establishment of a Jewish state to get rid of them or to plant an ally in their region, the same reason the U.S. started supporting them, 
or both? I think it's both for sure. Um, it can be many, many more reasons to it. It's not just one. All I think are important to look into. Some are far more important than others. And one that is really important is for sure getting rid of Jews to export out its problems out to others. This is very much a European um, world of 1492 tendency. And again, when I say European, I'm talking about the Europe from above, not the Europe from below. The, the European tendency to in creating a peaceful Europe with international law and the state system, which is very, you know, enlightenment, like very modern post-1492 events, that they were warring so much, fighting between each other so much that they decided to create international law so that they could export their violence out to others. So that's why with us, anything went. There's lawlessness. We don't have any rights. You know, we didn't have, we, we don't, we didn't have any rights. And now it's questionable that we still, that we even have rights even today, the non-Europeans. And so creating Israel as a way to push Jews out of Europe is actually what the Zionist movement itself said that it would be. It was telling its own oppressors that the problem with anti-Semitism is that Jews are a minority everywhere they are and they're scattered. So then they need to come together in a place, a nation state, so that they can be a majority. And that's why he didn't care where it was because it was really about being a majority nation state somewhere. But notice that in Theodore Herzl, the founder of Zionism is the one who said this. Notice that he's placing the problem of anti-Semitism on Jews, not on his oppressors, not on the system. And that's because he was appealing to his own oppressors, so he wasn't going to insult them. And that was part of the appeal to have to, to solve the Jewish question by having Jews leave Europe. And together, at the same time, was saying that it would be what you said there about about having an ally in the region. It's exactly how he built it, that Israel, that the Jewish state would be uh, like an, an outpost of civilization in face of all of this barbarism. And also, when we see the plans for Sykes-Pico, a lot of this geopolitically, in addition to spiritually, because again, we have the Christian Zionists that want Jews to go and build a third temple in Jerusalem. So there's all kinds of interests, and some of them are shared by the same people, and some of them are in conflict, but they all are real. This, the cutting up of the, of the area was also about, an, about oil here, Kuwait, Iraq, right, and having this pipeline from Palestine into the Mediterranean Sea, which uh, Benjamin Net Netanyahu um, talked about on September 22nd in the United Nations, that pipeline. Thank you for that question, Rula. Groker's music. I feel a lot of discourse in the U.S. is entrenched in debate culture. Political debates are not about truth, but obscuring truth. Might be a stretch, but again, it appears linked to us versus them mentality. That's, yeah, that's real spot on. I've been learning also... The phenomenon, I think you're so right, because even like when we talk about politics, and I noticed this during 2016 with the, with the Trump campaign, I started, to, I, was, I was following it very closely, the Trump campaign and of course, Hillary's campaign, not because I liked either of them, but because I really like to understand empire and how it changes, how it shifts and how it's still the same. And what I noticed during the Trump election or the primaries in 2016, as I was listening to a lot of his supporters and watching the rallies, is I was like, wow, I think he's going to win. I really think he has a chance of winning. And when I would say that, people would laugh. And if they listened to me speak long enough when I would give an analysis about it, they would be like wondering if I was hyping Trump. And I was like, what? What? And I realized that when usually when we talk about politics or get into debates, it's kind of like a sporting event. Like you don't want to like, like you want to keep hyping up your favorite team and you feel bad that if you say something bad about them, then it's going to cause bad juju. I don't know what it is, but it's a difficulty in making the distinction between a normative statement and an analytical statement. A normative statement 
is a statement that you make, that we make, when we want to say, like, do you wish the world were, were like this? Like, you, you're saying that the world should be this way. That's a normative statement. That should be the norm. An analytical statement is not that. An analytical statement is just you saying something from an analysis you have. It's not about how you wish the world to be, but it's about how you see the world as it is, not how you wish it to be. And I, I, I make a lot of analytical statements. I look a lot for how the world is rather than how I rather than just how I wish for it to be. I think about how I wish for it to be all the time. When I see that little miracles and beauty in everyday life, I'm happy to see that world that I wish would be, that it is. But those are fleeting moments. So in this fight, what we need to look at is how the world actually is, whether it, it jives with what we think or what we don't. And so what I was doing during the Trump campaign in 2016 was giving analytical statements about why I thought he was going to win. And I started to notice that people were taking those as normative statements, like me hyping him, like as if I wanted him to win. And I didn't understand that uh, until maybe a couple months later when people started to ask me if I wanted Trump to win. Um, but I think it's like what you're saying is that we have such a hard time with debate. The discourse in the U.S., as you're saying, is entrenched in debate culture. The de political debates are not about truth, but obscuring truth. It's also like it's a lot of people like wanting to be right and not really being like willing to be challenged on something. I'm always really thankful for the, the truly anti domination, anti white supremacy, white people in my life, I hold on to them like gems, because they have had to do a lot of work to challenge themselves, as have anti Zionist Jews. I hold anti Zionist Jews also really close to my heart, because I understand they've had to lose a lot of friends, lose a lot of family, challenge themselves rather than allowing their life to just be easy. And that ignorance is bliss. They've really wanted to seek out the truth, which is another thing that I think makes it really hard for us to have real debate. And that is that not everybody wants to seek the truth. And that's something I thought everybody wanted to do when I was growing up, that everybody was a truth seeker. But as I've gotten older, I've learned the hard truth that not everybody wants to know the truth all the time. A lot of the time, people want to be lied to. And I think that part of that is um, the psychology of how politics play out. Like politics play out the way that they play out, modern politics, electoral politics, especially the way that they play out is through the spectacle of uh, who can lie to you in a way that makes you feel as if, you know, things are okay. And that's really having tapped into the psychology, I think. But a lot of us don't want to be lied to. Um, and I think a lot of folks right now who are learning for the first time about the truth, the, the actual truth about what's going on with Palestine and the truth about Zionism are in that place. So let's hold each other close. Let's hold each other tight, right? Uh, it, it's a, from my experience, it's a beautiful place over here. Um, and it does mean, though, that we need to seek some truth, that we can't be lying to ourselves, we can't be lying to each other, right? We're really trying to get this right. This is not some hypothetical thing going on in an academic seminar, like we actually need right or wrong shit to take place, so in our analyses. <clears throat> Rosalilia, so true, they can't handle the cognitive dissonance and distortion of their lives. That's real. I mean, the cognitive dissonance, that is a huge commitment. Once, once you've had that cognitive dissonance, it's a huge commitment to see it through because it means it's going to absorb a lot of your life in trying to figure out now what what the reality is. And so it can be a lot easier to just not do it because life can be overwhelming sometimes. So thank you, thank you for that. This is my first live, by the way, I'm really enjoying these comments um, that we can connect like this. Um, thank you. So I want to show you some more maps because we're doing a teaching on Palestine on this day, December 11, a global general strike to stop the genocide in Gaza and all of Palestine. We were at this map 
with Western Palestine, the accident of history, <laughs> because all of Palestine in the Zionist mind is farther out to what is today Iraq. And then this set of maps, the dispossession of Palestinians, the shrinking, shrinking land of Palestine in favor of a territory called the State of Israel. And what we see here in this panel is the after the war that created the State of Israel, this is what the boundaries look like. Now, we don't call them borders. Israel has never defined its borders. It refuses to define its borders because it's still expanding. I don't know of any other country in the world, any other nation state that has not defined its borders, but Israel has not defined its borders. Um, a border would be, again, between friends. They're called amity lines. Borders are between those who are above, those who are the rulers. They have to be understood as equals, humans, not subhumans, like how they've relegated the rest of us, non-Europeans, right? And so Israel does not define its borders with Palestine. It, it doesn't understand Palestinians to be equal to it, to be defining borders. So Palestine is the below. Pal the border between Israel and Palestine is that line between the above and the below, which is actually a foundation. It's not a wall, it's a foundation. So the state of Israel is created in 1948. All of these people, Palestinians, three, uh, three quarters of a million of them fled the war, the terror, and have not been allowed to come back. Many of them went into the Gaza Strip, into what became the West Bank. These territories didn't exist before as that. Of course, the land was there, but something called the Gaza Strip like that with those borders or boundaries and the West Bank. Those become new, new names for these, these territories, new territories. Lots of uh, refugee camps here. I had the honor of living here and being a student of the refugees, fucking chingones. I hope that I have some maps to show you about all about some of the oh yeah I do about some of the lessons that they've taught me um there's refugee camps in the west bank there are a lot of refugees in Gaza there's also a lot of refugees in Jordan next door and Syria in the north and Lebanon in the north and of course all over the diaspora and what the two-state solution is supposed to be is a return to the 1967 borders, called 1967 borders, because after 1967, there was another war that Israel went at and took the West Bank and Gaza and started to occupy both, especially the West Bank. So now it's like Swiss cheese. There's hardly any, ter there's even less than that now of the territory that Palestinians control and had had um, settlements in the Gaza Strip, but remove them in 2005 um, and then move them to the West Bank. And that made it easier for Israel to carpet bomb all of the Gaza Strip because now there weren't any Jews there. Now there weren't any Israeli citizens there that it cares about. And so um, since Israel's quote unquote disengagement, you might hear this online. A lot of people were like, Israel doesn't occupy the Gaza Strip. Like people really like, I'm telling you, the education in this country is horrifying. Like, the Gaza Strip here, Israel had uh, uh, settlements there and then moved them to the West Bank and ever since has been just throwing bombs indiscriminately into the Gaza Strip. Um, the first major war was in 2009. And this looks very similar to here. So this is a really important map. Um, I want to show you the, the Palestine one first because this is a more accurate map of, of Palestine because it shows Palestinians inside the white. Those are Palestinian citizens of Israel who were the Palestinians who didn't, uh, did, that didn't flee and therefore didn't have to return home because they stayed. Uh, but they were put under martial law for 20 years almost, uh, for the first 20 years of Israel's life and then forced citizenship, Israeli citizenship, on the Palestinians here. And they don't, don't, we don't call them Israelis. Some of them might like to be called Israelis. I don't know any Palestinians with Israeli citizenship that like to be called Israelis. 
We call them Palestinian citizens of Israel and they are treated like third class citizens. The second class citizens are the ones who are Jewish and not white, who are Jewish and African, Jewish and Middle Eastern Arab descent. Because again, Israel was created for European Jews. <clears throat> Excuse me. Israel was created for European Jews. And sadly, after the Holocaust, because you know, so many Jews had died, had been killed, genocided by the Nazis and with the complicity of the other European powers. Because so many European Jews had perished when Israel was created right after the Holocaust, they had a problem. The Israeli state had a problem in that it needed to fill up the state with a lot of Jews because it had a demographic problem. They called it first a demographic miracle that in 1948, all of these Palestinian refugees, well, all these Palestinians fled, became refugees, fled, making it so now there was a majority of uh, Jews than Christians and Muslims because Israel has wanted to be a democratic state, to be respected by the world of nations in a post-colonial so-called moment. And what it did is it imposed citizenship on Israelis, on, I'm sorry, on, it imposed citizenship, Israeli citizenship on Palestinians and recruited Jews from other parts of the world, non-European parts of the world, black Jews from Africa, brown Jews from uh, North Africa and the Middle East and Iraq, for example, uh, there's a lot of stories of them recruiting Jews by terrorizing them, by blowing up a synagogue, for example, uh, and making it seem as if all of a sudden these Muslims and Christians just hate Jews. No, that, that has been created. That animosity has been created. So what we have is second-class citizens and third-class citizens uh, the, the second class citizens, the first class citizens of Israel are the white European Jews. There's totally like this racial stratification internally in Israel that it, it's only kept together because of the enemy called the Palestinians. But once they don't have an enemy, they dissolve. They completely fall apart. In the, in the 1970s, in fact, there was a Black Panther Party that was created in Israel by Mizrahim Jews, Jews from the from the East the non-European Jews, to just show the world how discriminatory Israel is with non-European Jews. So this map shows, especially in the, Gal in the northern part in the Galilee, there are a lot of Palestinian citi uh, citizens of Israel. And in the north is where Nazareth is, where Jesus of Nazareth is from. So Nazareth is in what is today called Israel, in the territory of Israel, which of course the land is Palestine. But the, the territory, the control of the place, Nazareth is inside Israel territory, inside 48, and Bethlehem is in the West Bank, and Jerusalem is also in the West Bank, except that Jerusalem has been annexed by Israel, so that it's not at all even considered part of the West Bank, which is understood as what would be a state for Palestine. So. This, th this is such a familiar uh, disappearance of what we've seen here in the United States and what becomes the United States, this territory called the United States, right? And so this is something for all of us, Palestinians included, Palestinians who live in the United States and Canada and, uh, and other parts as settlers, like this is something for us to really get down to the root of. And a lot of Palestinians, more and more and more Palestinians, are totally like, yeah, we need to talk about it all, not just Palestine. And so this is where a lot of the conversation you can, um, you, you can, I think that we can be certain um, it's going to go into a world question, not just a Palestine question. Oh, yeah, here's that map of Netanyahu at the United Nations showing a map of so-called Israel in 1948. No, you already know. We already know that's a lie, but he's over at the United Nations lying. And then he shows another map of the uh, neighboring Arab countries that are normalizing with Israel and draws with a red marker, draws with a red marker, 
that pipeline and talks about how it's the Palestinians who are an obstacle to peace, not Israel. And without the Palestinians, this will be the new Middle East and it will be prosperous and all of that. So by erasing Palestine, Netanyahu thinks that he will solve everything. And he does speak in a language that a lot of the regimes understand. A lot of the regimes are down. Like, they want money. A lot of the, re- I mean, the regimes want their money. They want their power. They just give lip service to Palestine. It's the people, their people, who love Palestine. And that's become clearer and clearer over the last decade, especially. And especially following October 7. This I did a video of. Uh, earlier, The Subjective Atlas of Palestine. I just love showing this book because when we look at so many maps of Palestine, like looking at how Palestinian artists themselves <laughs> map Palestine, and there's a, that famous tic-tac-toe one. Well, I it's famous to me. Um, I always think about that map when I think about the Treaty of Tordesillas and the vice royalties. And, and I didn't even know as I was doing this research with Palestine on on the borders and on maps that I would even go back to 1492. I I had to trace my way over there to try to find the commonalities that we have with the struggle. And then of course this one, this one's really dope. This is a, this, this shows an above and below of Palestine and Israel. So that border, I really like this map. Um, There is also In refugee camps, any refugee camp you go to, you're going to see the entire map of Palestine. There's no way you're going to see Gaza and the West Bank like the Palestinian leadership in the negotiations only maps Gaza and the West Bank. The Palestinian refugees are like, hell no. And this is in a refugee camp that has the names of the villages of everybody from that camp. We will return. Um, and yeah, I guess I will wrap up with these two. I had the honor of living in Palestine uh, for a year and visiting before and after for a little bit, for several months at a time. But like having lived there um, and worked and learned, worked with and learned from the refugees in the camps was some of my greatest growth as just as a person and of course as an intellectual but as a person like and in a refugee camp that I was working at I I was I was there um I wasn't working like to make money I was volunteering and I went to volunteer to work with with little kids um on some art just color with them and you know I, I want to listen to their Arabic and they could teach me Arabic um, and so as I was there in the camp, they found out that I make maps, that I'm a geographer and immediately they wanted to know, can you, can you map the camp? And I was doing this whole research project on how maps have ruined everything <laughs> on how Palestine, how all of our lands were mapped like in this property and no, we don't want to map anymore. But they're like, but then they started telling me, no, no it's like. You don't understand. Israel has the maps of the camps whenever they arrest us, whenever they do one of their raids in the camp. In their GPS, they like to show us that they have a map of the camp and our name is on top of the building that we live in. So Israel has hyper surveillance and it has the maps of the camps. And here are the refugees in the camp were asking me to map. And so, of course, I said yes. And uh, I had to find an, a high resolution photograph of the camp um, which which was not easy but totally possible because on Google Earth the Google Earth ones wouldn't work because on Google Earth Israel um, is not high res it's like the only place in the world along with you other US militaries that is not high res um, but Israel does take high res photography and then sells it in, in the market and so I was able to get one a copy of this camp of Ida camp. Um, 
And so I mapped it and I mapped it like this. I just mapped the, you know, the buildings, the dark gray is where the camp is. The light gray is not the camp. That black line is the apartheid wall. And if you can see like little dots, that's, those are sniper towers. And it, it has some greenery, it has some trees. These are olive trees and there's like trees peppered in also throughout the camp. That's something really beautiful. A lot of the, the refugees are farmers and they, they love the land. And so they have little plants as much as they can. And then it, it has this, the, the wall has this really weird uh, shape here because Rachel's tomb is right here. There's a cemetery here and Rachel's tomb, a holy tomb is there. And so they raised this part for tourist buses. So Jerusalem is up here. And then this is Bethlehem. And no one here on this side of the wall can now go onto the other side of the wall. So they can't visit Jerusalem anymore, Palestinians. And so this is all for tourists to come in, park their bus, and then go visit Rachel's tomb. And there's a refugee camp right there, right there, that you cannot miss. And sniper towers. And this is what it looks like from the roof of the camp. You see the olive orchard that was taken. And you also see... The sniper tower, all, all blacked out, fire, and of course, graffiti, Guernica. And because I saw a map of <laughs> all of Palestine, it made me think about how, even though this is a colonial map, totally colonial, the shape of Palestine, these borders that, you know, we see in, in the shape in this graffiti. Palestinians, like a lot of movements in resistance, turn this against the colonizer. This is a terrifying map for Zionism, terrifying. It says we will return and then it shows all of Palestine and it's just graffiti. It's not an official anything. And it's far more terrifying than anything that has happened in the so-called peace process negotiation bullshit. This is how Palestinians taught me, along with mapping the Ida refugee camp project, that the map is not inherently good or bad. It's a tool and it depends on how we deploy it. So just how it can be the art of war. It can also be the art of resistance. And so, just walking around the camp, I decided I wanted to just give tribute, pay tribute to all of the maps in the camp on that day that I could find of all of Palestine in the graffiti. <laughs> there is not one map of the West Bank and Gaza. There's so much more. Um, I will leave it there for now. I want to just engage with Rula's comment. Yeah, that's so true. It's so hard for Palestinians to get their hands on maps, and it makes us feel so powerless. Looking at maps helped me personally see how Israel divides and controls us. That is so real. I want to I wanna show you something, but it's underneath. Okay, hold on a sec. <laughs> Prep for this. <laughs> I love this. This is such a beautiful testament to the Palestinian resistance. This is Salman Abu Sitta. Atlas of Palestine, 1917 to 1966. He has a lot more, but look at this. It is a map, like an atlas of all the villages. <laughs> Look at it. Like, it's incredible. One day we'll have to do a whole thing about it. But Salman Abu Sitta is the cartographer, the Palestinian cartographer of, Pal of all of Palestine. All of Palestine. Not just this... Gaza Strip and West Bank bullshit two-state solution. It's from the river to the sea. I know, it's incredible. Atlas of Palestine, 
1966. He has one 1947, I believe. He has one from even earlier 19th, uh, 19th century. So, yeah, it has been really hard for... The maps question has been really painful. It was part of the history that I learned. In the negotiations with Israel in Oslo, they were the Palestinian leadership was signing Israeli maps. And that was like, what the fuck are you doing? This Edward Said uh, was writing so much about this process. And he was the one that coined, as far as we know in geography, coined this term counter map. He, he said he was so upset that the Palestinian leadership was signing Israel's maps that why don't you create your own maps? Excuse me. Like, and, you know, and Palestinians had been using the map, the Palestine map as like the logo. But in terms of like a scientific cartographic map, like had it mapped in this way as much before, like in the 80s, they started. I actually found in Palestine the first map of all of Palestine scientifically made uh, in 1983 and it took five years so it was finished in 1988 but in 1988 was the same year that the Palestinian leadership the PLO uh, leadership uh, uh, agreed officially to a two-state solution so after that the, the Palestinian leadership in the West Bank only mapped Gaza and the West Bank but Salman Abu is like no <laughs> we're gonna map everything yeah so this is a this is an incredible monument to the palestinian resistance palestinians are such incredible cartographers now and but they're just not cartographers they they really understand um and through a lot of trial and error i mean nobody's born oh you know a revolutionary um we're made and palestinians uh made this really beautiful book and have made a lot of maps since they just didn't have these scientific maps in force during the early years of the negotiations. Now they do. But I love showing this and I love showing the subjective atlas. Let me bring it out, actually. The subjective atlas of Palestine. I did a little book review uh, about this. It's on, my, um, it's on my wall, I think. And this is the one that has you know, the, the other maps. And all of them, all of them necessary, all of them beautiful. The problem, of course, is when we just have one way of mapping, then we start thinking that the world is just this one way, you know? So I think that's it. I think I'll leave it there. Yeah, I'm so happy to see y'all being introduced to this book. Um, we'll do a bigger thing on, on it, I'm sure. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you, everyone for being curious too, stay curious, please, about what's going on in Palestine. It has helped me understand what's going on in the world a lot more than it has under helped me understand about specifically Palestine. So thank you all, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.